Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Malone, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Um, I just released an episode yesterday, so if you didn't see it, uh, it's Frank Barberi uh, talking about Violent Love, his wonderful new book with uh, Victor Santos. We also talk about Five Ghosts. Very cool stuff. I just don't want you to miss it. Today, New Comic Book Day, we are talking to Paul Cornell about an excellent new uh, series that he has from IDW. It's called Saucer State. It is related to his Saucer Country series that he did uh, for Vertigo. Uh, same creators. It's Ryan Kelly on art, and it's Paul Cornell on story. Uh, I am pleased to say, because I had read um, the Saucer Country stuff, but it was so long ago and so many comic books ago, I thought I had forgotten some of the stuff. I felt very comfortable picking up this first issue of Saucer State, um, I think that people will – in fact, he gave me the first two issues, and I think people will be very uh, up-to-date if this is your first issue for this story. Great UFO conspiracy stuff. Imagine if the president of the United States had a UFO experience and thinks that now that she is in that inner circle – of uh, the secret government information, she can get to the bottom of her own UFO experience. The stuff she learns is not quite what she was expecting. And that's the beginnings of this new series, Saucer State. Uh, Cornell calls it volume two of Saucer Country. But again, I do think it stands on its own. And I think uh, he and Ryan uh, really made a big effort to explain what you need to know in this first issue and moving forward. Really great stuff. And it's a, a pleasure to welcome Paul back. I always enjoy uh, talking to Paul about not only uh, his comic book work, but also his novels, his original novels, his huge body of work in Doctor Who, whether it's been comics, short stories, uh, radio or audio dramas, and uh, the like. And it's so uh, interesting to hear what he thinks of uh, the current Doctor Who run. It's been a while since we talked, so we, we talk a bit about uh, Peter Capaldi and Bill and uh, where things are going in this uh, this new 10th season. Although for me, it's not the 10th season. It goes back to 1963, for God's sake. So, uh, you know, 48 or whatever whatever year they're on currently. Uh, but it's uh, it's wonderful to talk to him. And also, just the nature of television. I, I, I can't help it. When I have these uh, TV or film people on, I just think we're in such an interesting time with streaming and all the various platforms. Uh, the potential opportunities that they present and uh, what they think of the current market. Um, so it's uh, it's great to get Paul Cornell's uh, perspective. We also talk, he's uh, in the midst of a Vampirella run as well. So it's, it's just wonderful to welcome uh, Paul Cornell back to today's Word Balloon. It's brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, for that support. And uh, this is what I try to do is uh, uh, crank out as many episodes as I can each month to give everybody uh, something uh, interesting to listen to. And hopefully you'll uh, enjoy the uh, audio content that uh, helps expand our uh, interest in uh, the comic book world, the hobby, uh, and its uh, related uh, subjects. God, Paul and I even talk a bit about Supergirl, and it's funny because I hadn't seen uh, the series uh, wrap-up. And we inadvertently, because of what I liked at the beginning of the season with the inclusion of Superman, uh, it's great to see what uh, Superman and Supergirl did. And uh, spoiler-free... But we do end up uh, talking about a lot of the themes that kind of happened in these last couple episodes with Supergirl and Superman. And I, and I think it's kind of interesting. Again, I saw them after the conversation and I'm like, oh, so if you want, you might want to watch, if you haven't already, uh, the Supergirl uh, wrap up for this season and then uh, listen to that portion of our conversation. Maybe, maybe not. But uh, thank you, League, for your support uh, through Patreon. Uh, it's, uh, it helps uh, keep Word Balloon going. A word balloon is free. It will always be free. And I, and I love what I do. And, I, and it's 12 years running, and I'm, I'm really enjoying myself even more. So it's a pleasure to bring you these shows. If you think it's uh, worth your while and, and is adding to your experience and you think it's worth the price of a comic book, even a dollar a month, uh, go to patreon.com slash word balloon, and you can subscribe there. Or you can go to the ad on wordballoon.com that has Patreon right there, and that will link you if you click on that to my Patreon page. But truly, uh, more, as I said in the last episode, uh, a, a lot more uh, subscribers this week, and it, it means a lot, especially be while I'm between full-time radio jobs. So thank you very much, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by In Stock Trades at InStockTrades.com. And, uh, God, there's so many great Paul Cornell books available at InStock Trades. I would be foolish not to acknowledge them. So let's talk about some of these. Uh, one of my favorite uh, things that uh, Paul did at D.C., 
was the Knight and Squire trade paperback, uh, Paul Cornell and Jimmy Broxton. Uh, it's it's such a great uh, Batman of England story and the differences uh, of the Knight and Squire compared to Batman and Robin. It, it's such a great story. It's 42% off, just $8.69. You can get uh, Doctor Who, The Four Doctors from uh, 2015, Paul Cornell and Neil Edwards, and a, and a great uh, Doctor, uh, you know, compa- or Doctor... Uh, combination of uh, whenever uh, more iterations of the doctors get together it's always a fun story that is 25 percent off 14 dollars and 99 cents you can get uh this damn band the trade paperback i'm still kicking myself that i didn't talk about paul this uh, book with paul while it was coming out from dark horse but you can get the trade paperback 45 percent off it's just nine dollars and 89 cents some of the great paul cornell things that are available at instocktrades.com uh, don't forget, if your orders are $50 or more, you'll receive free shipping, and you'll find great books at great prices at InStockTrades.com. All right, without further ado, let us begin our conversation with Paul Cornell. Welcome back, Paul Cornell. Always a pleasure to talk to him. Let's get to it now on Word Balloon. Paul Cornell, welcome back to Word Balloon. I, I'm sorry that it's been so long, and as we were saying before we started recording, uh, I missed the opportunity to talk to you about your, your uh, Dark Horse book, right? That damn band? Um, this damn band. This damn band, excuse me. So. A, a ridiculous title choice on my part because if you Google that, what are you going to see? You're going to see the damned. That's who you're going to. <laughs> True. Okay, I can see that. As um, I discovered, as I discovered after it was printed. You know? Oh well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you were just saying uh, we we were talking again. We thought we were recording, but I was saying I, I enjoyed it and, and I hope that you will get back to it eventually. Well, thank you. I'm. I'm it, I, I love Dark Horse. I, I'd be. You know. Apart from the fact that every moment of my day is um, agendaized and um, uh, you know put into a to-do list right now, they are one, one of the lovely comic companies that I'd love to work for again. I understand, and uh, yeah, man, uh, we're we're here to talk about uh, Saucer Country, which yeah, uh, and and I do remember when it was uh, coming out from Vertigo. We even briefly talked about it. And excuse me, I'm looking right now. Of course, you, you did change the name of it. Saucer State is the current so- title. Kieran Gillen made exactly the same mistake today while he, while he was being kind enough to publicize it. So <laughs> big, big, big capital letters from him a moment later. I will never get that title right. <laughs> Which I don't know was, was you know, a, a statement to intent. But there we are. Um, no, it's a source, source, source of state because it's um, a brand new story. And we actually wanted to, you know, kind of uh, underline that. Oh, I see. So... How many issues of Saucer Country did you get out? Uh, 14, 15. Okay. Yeah. And, this, um, and, the, and so, yeah, go on, please. Explain the, you know, what's going on here. <laughs> Saucer State is the sequel to Saucer Country. Um, it's, um, it's not so much a jumping on point as the second movie. Okay. Um, um, you can join in without knowing a thing. And um, it, it, uh, Alvar- uh, Arcadia Alvarado becoming president, our heroine, at the end of um, Saucer Country. Um, now she is president, uh, and that's where we start Saucer State, which is going to be two six-issue miniseries. And, I mean, it would be just a 12-issue run, apart from the fact we don't want to kill Ryan Kelly. And... Uh, <laughs> So he, we, we'll, we'll just leave him panting in a darkened room for a couple of weeks between the, the, the two bunches of six issues. <laughs> and um, uh, it's uh, the story of, of Arcadia as president. Um, she was abducted by aliens, in inverted commas. And the last series was the story of her uh, presidential run, keeping that knowledge in the back of her head and wondering what, what that was. And Saucer State, well, Saucer State, she thinks, is going to be the story of her using presidential power to find out exactly what happened to her. Sure. But something enormous happens at the end of issue one, which we can't reveal with spoilers. Indeed. Uh, And that is what the two sets of six are going to be about, largely. It turns everything on its head. It sets up a brand new thing for new readers and it all ultimately brings everything together. At the end of these two lots of six, every question from the whole lot of two runs will be answered. 
all the boxes will be ticked, all the little dots will be tied up. You will have closure, no matter where you joined us. Um, <laughs> did you hear that, X-Files? Closure. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I'm still looking forward to season 11 or 12, whatever the hell it is, the next next year's uh, Absolutely. mini, mini more season. Da- more Darren Morgan would be very welcome. <laughs> is that the guy from uh, Flight of the Concords? Yeah, yeah. Oh that's God, him. that was awesome! My God, what a great episode! And also that's that he was dressed like Carl Kolshak from the Night Stalker. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the guy who wrote um, uh, Mulder and Scully meet the Weird Monster this time around. Yeah. Oh yeah, tremendous. Mm. But anyway, uh, back to Saucer Country. Yes, uh, you know you would expect. Uh, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna get used to <laughs> yeah, saying that. I did it again, Saucer State. You're right. Shame on me. Uh, <laughs> no, it's it, it, it. You would think that obviously being president. Uh, Arcadia could kind of get to the bottom of this. I mean that you you know we we all have that uh, notion in our heads. Even even President Trump was probably sat down in, in the secret room and they give him the secret book and it's like, okay, here's what you really need to know about what's going on. And you would think all the mysteries of Area Fifty One and, and and the like and everything would finally be revealed. And I, I I think if they had done that, we would now know everything. You know, he would he would he would have gone <laughs> on to that evening. You know, <laughs> this is true. I understand. Oh, I know. Well, we'll leave that for another time. But uh, God, I got to tell you, no, I, I, uh, I, you were kind enough to give me the first two issues of Saucer State to look at, and uh, yeah, again, I mean, I, I was intrigued by the beginnings of the Vertigo run, and now, uh, it, you know, equally so with uh, with uh, the, the volume two, and and where things you. are going. Um, I, it, it, Kieran referred to it today as competence porn, and um, <laughs> it's. It, it's very much that. If you like, if you like people doing, um, being very good at their jobs and um, doing clever things, it's all about clever things. It's also all about UFO mythology, and I think this is um, we kind of uh, maybe we led the audience the wrong way in Saucer Country um, because I think they were expecting an actual alien invasion, and what what they got was an exploration of UFO mythology. And I think this time round, our readership know what they're going to get. They're going to get um, a lot of exploration of that real life, in inverted commas, um, UFO mythology, that lovely, uh, nuanced, multicolored, um, as American as jazz mythology. And um, so there's loads and loads of references and encounters and um, oh, everything from, and I'm, I'm just dropping a few names that'll make, Fellow UFO enthusiasts go, ooh, that. Um, Serpo, Orthon, the Hopkins, Kellyville Goblins. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, the connections between Hollywood and, and flying saucers um, and all of the political stuff, all of, um, uh, as you said, that, that, that continuing notion that the president must know something. And um, it, so, yeah, I'm, I'm. And one of the lovely things uh, people keep asking me: uh, How do you feel writing a show, uh, a series about American politics, given all the huge uh, developments of the last year or so? Yeah. We we kind of saw it coming. I gotta say, <laughs> in the, in that one of our our major plot lines, which was seeded in Saucer Country. Um, is about um, psyops um, being used to influence uh, the elections of the United States of America <laughs> by an unfriendly foreign power, or possibly a friendly foreign power. And, um, it, it, that's right at the heart of this. We are we are a bulletin from the brightest timeline. We are um, uh, the story of a smart, um, successful political female president. Um, but we're also going to be very much dealing with the shadow of our own of our own reality over this book because, kind of at, at its heart, it's what it's about. I I really lucked out with that one. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so um, <laughs> it's um, as people will understand what I mean as we go further into it. But there's a very Trumpish figure in the book who's there to represent that feeling in American politics, which is true in Arcadia's world as well. But 
the major thing is yet to come. And uh, we're off to Russia in um, uh, issue six and seven. Oh, wow. So, yeah, or, or issue six and issue number one of the second mini, depending on how IDW want to play it. I'm not sure which way they'll go with that yet. I see. Okay. I, um, you know, it's funny. I've been, I've been thinking about uh, how uh, British writers in particular, and this has come up before in my podcasts as well or, or just in my mind, but how uh, it just seems to me that uh, a lot of the British writers have a little more um, of a sense of humor and and uh, and think in terms of parody a bit more than the dramatic uh, work of a DC or a Marvel writer in terms of, you know, kind of taking the stuff, you know, uh, accepting the realities of whatever comic book they're writing for either DC or Marvel, but, you know, that it's that it's action drama. And it always seems to me that, like, a lot of the 2000 AD stuff that I've read and um, things like, uh, you know, Pat Mills uh, uh, doing martial law and things like that, that there's always just a little bit more, like I said, parody uh, in mind on, on some of these, uh, in, in some British minds. And I wonder in, in your own mind if, you know, again... But given what you're doing and stuff, I mean, and, and clearly we're, we're laughing at some of the stuff that you're you're putting out there in Saucer State. So, yeah, I mean, is parody always kind of part of the plan when, when you're writing a new story? Well, I, I do try and restrain myself in Saucer State in that I'm aware I'm writing an American story. So one has to take on a certain American sensibility. I don't want this to have that distanced thing of Judge Dredd. Okay. I, want this, mm-hmm. I want this to be right amongst the, the real research of American politi- politics. Um, So any humor really is character humor. But um, having said that, I very much understand what you're saying about British writers. I mean, over here, I think the the barrier between drama and comedy is a lot, a lot thinner here. Mm -hmm. Um, That those two things kind of exist side by side. Um, We sort of we tend to associate pain with comedy um, (laughs) in a a way which is, um, I, I think, maybe. It maybe it's something that was formed during World War Two. It's hard to say. It's um, uh, certainly we 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 are happier. We're happier to have more comedy in our serious drama than other nations seem to want. And when we're when we're watching um, very American products. Um, we always t- tend to think, wow, that's, that, that's kind of serious. That's, um, nobody, nobody's really cracked a joke for some considerable time now. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, I do think this is, this, this is changing. I mean, you know, Joss Whedon has exactly that sensibility. Cool. Joss, Joss, and, and he, of course, he spent a lot of time in Britain when he was young, but I think that's, that that's changed a lot of. I mean, look at Supergirl, uh, or yeah, or the or the big superhero movies. You know, um, the, the the successful ones on Marvel's side, like Guardians, um, have have that have that pre mocked quality that um, the the movie itself is mocking itself, so the audience never get around to doing that. I I know I heard Alan Moore being interviewed by. Either it was in his conversation with Stuart Lee. It was part of that Chain Reaction BBC radio oh. series. And, you know, we get to stream that stuff. So, mm. so you know, if, if you know what to look for on BBC radio, you can hear a lot of great stuff, obviously. And I know you, you're aware of that, but I'm telling American listeners that they should be aware of that as well. And in particular, Alan was talking about The Blind Ballerina, which I had never read, but apparently was a, was a strip in one of, the, one of the weeklies that he used to oh. write. For. Am I right? In- in girls' comics, yes, absolutely. There you go, and and just the kind of, you know, obs- or extreme situations they would put her in, and that you know he was laughing about it and how much fun it was, and it, and also, and I do want to talk about Saucer State, but it, the the point about this is the upset over uh, Captain America currently in the Marvel Secret Empire story. I'm laughing because I understand that it's meant to be obviously an action drama but it's just the idea and everything it's it's a fun to me again and maybe i have a sixth sense of humor but it's a fun opportunity to really make captain america as virtuous as he's ever been 
but, you know, doing some outrageous and, and horrific things. I mean, God, you know, he ordered it, Rick Jones's ex- execution. And I'm like, oh, that's entertaining. And again, it's, because it's fiction and it's like it doesn't it hasn't crushed my heart or spirit or, or love of Captain America and what he represents. It's a fun exercise. And it's like, oh, look what they can do when they just tilted, a, a, you know, slightly askew. It's it, that's it's very Judge Dredd actually. I I do think Nick Spencer has something of that that lovely dark, dark juicy stuff as well. You know. There you go. Um, I, the person who really understood this is Jim Henson. His um, <laughs> his Muppet his Muppet shows film, filmed in England um, really have a British sensibility. Um, uh, that um, that desperation, the fact that. Um, Kermit knows the whole thing's about to fall apart any moment, <laughs> and um, and that he will literally do anything to keep the show going, um, or or something like Marvin Suggs' um, uh, Muppet Muppetoons Orchestra, where he's just bashing small soft creatures sing with a mallet. <laughs> you know, very Python esque, <laughs> absolutely, man. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That that or or was was that was Marvin was that Python or was that uh, the Muppets the, uh, the Muppet show? Yeah. Oh God, because okay, because I really remember the Python bit more. So uh, uh, that's funny. Uh, maybe maybe the Muppets just took it. You know, that's yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe that's cool. That's great, man. No, and I yeah, I, and that's the thing. I think this just kind of this very benign little subversive kind of you know underhand well, thing. You know, I had Tony Hendra on my uh, podcast about six months ago, and I'm kicking yeah. myself because I had totally forgotten that he, uh, among being Spinal Tap's manager and all the stuff he did for National Lampoon, but I had totally forgotten about Spitting Image. And I oh, loved yeah. Spitting Image, and I, I yeah. did not connect the dots and realize that he was such a you know big part, at least uh, initially, with Spitting Image. I love that series. Mm. I mean, in, in, in Source of State, I think it's about... Um the the comedy comes out of people who are out of their depth um, making jokes in order to feel a little better as they very carefully ease their way along and try to find things out. Um, the it, it, It's kind of, because it's a very detailed, very researched piece, I... I, I don't think it's appropriate to have that distance to to also mock because this is this is the trouble any time anybody tries to make a dread movie, which is the the last time round they really sorted um, by actually draining a lot of the humour out of it. But you know, it's very hard to be inside that thing while also having the distance of mocking that thing, and I, I don't think. I think American audiences would, would, would have a great deal of trouble dealing with, with the comedy, which is basically always trying to walk, uh, of dread, which is trying to walk two steps back from America and point and laugh at it, at it you know? I got you. I also, yeah. I, I also find a lot of similarities with Saucer State with uh, Contact. Um, oh, yeah. You know, yeah, okay, good. And that's, all right, I'm, I'm glad you agree right away. Because, yeah, and I, and I would definitely tell people if they, uh, you know, it comes out on Wednesday. By the way, Saucer State. Um, the likely, I'm trying to think of. Uh, man, I got like you know, I've got uh, Frank Barberi coming up, and he's got a book on Wednesday as well. I'm going to. Uh, I hope to put this out on Wednesday, if that's okay, Paul. Oh, cool, absolutely. Okay, that sounds great. Because and yeah, then it'll be on this on this on the racks when people hear this, and they can go out and buy it. But yeah, I would say as another possible uh, way of of hooking into this, if you you know if you like Contact, I think you'll definitely like. What uh, what you and Ryan are doing in uh, in Saucer State? Oh, yeah, very much so. I mean, it's um, it, it's that same thing of lots of real technical detail, but we also get we also get a little cosmic, um, and it, there's a later issue of the first of the first mini where Arcadia's ex husband Michael goes out into the New Mexican desert. Um, under the influence of um, some pharmaceutical compounds, and um, encou- encounters um, something from UFO mythology or someone, and um, uh, that's kind of a big angelic contact experience. It's kind of a um, 
a modern rendering of a religious experience in, you know, kind of uh, science fiction rather than fantastical terms, um, <laughs> which is kind of what the UFO experience is. I, I, I'm reading a lot of um, Jeffrey Kripal lately, um, who's a writer. Um, he's actually a historian of religion who treats um, what we call the paranormal seriously. So um, he, without necessarily believing in any particular detail, he records and w works to find patterns and, and sifts for a general meaning to the whole thrust of the history of UFO experiences. And um, so I've, I've kind of dedicated an issue to him at one point. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, so there's all of these... Because because it's a very hard body of of of, of experience of of law, because one could hardly call it history to 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 get one's hands into. It's um it's hard to get a perspective on because it is so subjective. Um, there is one there is a school of thought that says simply that none of these things ever happened at all, and um, there's another school of thought that says. It depends what you mean by happened. And um, there's a, a lovely, uh, I think it's, oh, is it Michael Berger quote, uh, which is, UFOs are far too interesting to be alien spaceships. And, um, <laughs> and, and that, that's, that sort of, some of that sums up where I am. I think there's, I think there's a story to be told about US military involvement in, in the history of, of flying saucers. Oh sure, but but it's not it's not the one people always tell. It's um, uh, I I think there's there's been a very clever intelligence game played out over decades about a lot of this stuff. Um, oh, that sounds intriguing. Okay, and well, you, yeah. you'll play that out in a future issue. You think? Oh, it's yeah, it's where we're going. A lot of it, you know, it's kind of um, it's part of our part of our aim. Very cool. Um, I re do you remember a show? I don't know if it went to England or not. Uh, in the seventies, called Pro Project Blue Book, and it was all about the Air Force accounts. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, was, it was called Project UFO, based on Project Blue Book. Oh, there you and go. It, and it was incredibly um, nuts and bolts-y and straightforward. <laughs> well, it, you saw the you saw the initial encounters in all their seventies special effects glory, and. Then you had our two very stoic heroes show up and investigate, and they always came to some kind of unsatisfactory conclusion and left. <laughs> and, and there was never any any Mulder style drama. You know, they never actually they never actually got to see any of the things they were documenting. Yep. Well, you know, and it um, makes sense because it was Jack Webb, the dragnet uh, right. actor and creator, that was behind. Project UFO. So yeah, it's uh, it, that, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, all I mean, my God, he can you know he can make reading a grocery list you know sound very dry and pragmatic and everything. So. It, it, was, it, it was kind of like a medical show about doctors who show up and don't actually heal anybody; they just <laughs> go away again. And, um, <laughs> I remember being a kid and being very intrigued by that show. And yeah, I, I think you're right. I think uh, each episode would be like, yeah, that's it. All right, <laughs> I guess I'll come back next week and maybe I'll see aliens next week. Which, which sort of sort of sums up um, actually the a very a very rational, very pragmatic way of dealing with this stuff that nevertheless does not make great entertainment. <laughs> so, very so, cool. So no, we, we 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 will get there. We will actually. We we I think we have a promise to the audience that we won't just go. Well, that was that was puzzling. Okay, next thing. <laughs> Or we might do something about that now you've mentioned it. I wonder if I can fit it in somewhere. <laughs> I like, uh, too, how, again, I mean, this is really a real-world reaction to this stuff happening. And you, you do not only, you know, not only from a uh, the president and our government dealing with it, but you really get a taste of how the world is treating it and even some of the inspirations as you've just discussed and how religious groups are reacting to it. And again, that's where it had that kind of uh, contact feel. I remember when uh, they were uh, driving down to where they were building that machine to 
establish contact and everything. And you had all the people on the beach and you had, you know, it was like Burning Man. You know, you had you had all the different crazy groups and stuff that were, you know, interpreting the, the potential of UFO contact in, in their own ways. And it was, yeah. you know, crazy stuff to the, the applied science that they were actually trying to do to make it happen. Well, well, one of the difficulties we faced is that this mythology has gone away a little now. That um, uh, the greys aren't really the pop cultural um, monster of the moment anymore, apart from to the people who they're still abducting, of course. But uh, <laughs> he said with a deal of irony. Um, but, um, but but also meaning it. Um, but um, so it's kind of about dealing with this body of mythology that's just tailing off now. Um, Fortean Times, which I'm, I'm a great fan of, and I did a, a piece about Source State for them um, in their last issue, um, oh, the, the Journal of Record of the Unexplained. And they've kind of, a few years back, they decided to take a considerably more sceptical tone in their regular UFO column. Huh. Uh, and um, it, it, it feels like the subject has sort of been drained of its mystery a little, um, largely because everybody has a camera and video on them now at all times. And um, Okay, yeah. And you'd think that if ever you, we were to get a convincing bit of proof, now would be the time, and this has not materialised. Interesting, um, sure. And... Um, just the zeitgeist seems to have moved away, or, or maybe the, the presence of whatever UFOs were have moved away. There is a school of thought that says that they were here for a few years. That this is very much a nuts and bolts school of thought, not what I, I, I adhere to. The idea that there was a visit and now it's over, and um, that you know landing parties and scouts came forth, and we've erected an enormous cargo court about it, but no further info is to be had, you know. Oh, and do you think it... I always appreciated the idea that the alien technology kind of crept into our own and explaining the uh, the stealth aircraft that we create, the smartphones that we all now have, and that a right. lot of that technology, you know, might have been alien influenced, given the leap that we've all... at least the leap that we perceive in terms of well, where this stuff has gone. But then, then, then we wouldn't be able to see the roots of all that tech. I, 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 I don't agree with that at all. I, I, I think, I think a technologist could lead you through development to development every single thing we have. Understood. And, and, and actually, the lack of any great leap, I think, would indicate this hasn't happened, um, especially in terms of space flight. You know, we, 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 if if anybody did ever get a, a flying saucer, nobody's really made use of it, which is actually a point a point we we address. Yes, yeah. But, um, but the um, uh, I, I'm there are certain there are certain things that, that there's a very a very nuts and bolts ufology, a very um, uh, a very these are alien spacecraft ufology, which I think has simply contributed nothing and has gone nowhere and, and and kind of drags the subject down all the time. And um, I, I especially don't like the right-wing tinge of a lot of the um, conspiracy theory that's become associated with UFOs. Um, I'm not aware of that. Tell me, what what <laughs> what, what, oh, what are they saying? Yeah, well, you know, it's that the government are creating vapor trails and um, killing cattle and uh, um, you, you know tagging, genetically tagging you with immunization things like that um, some some of the results of, of this stuff have been terrifying you know the um, the anti-vaccination movement in the states yes uh, does have some roots in 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 that um that mixture of, of of conspiracy theory law, which also connects to, you know, kind of cattle mutilations and alien abductions, you know? Wow. I mean, you know, the X-Files made use of that vaccination stuff for a bit. I'm not, I'm not sure that they're proud of that anymore, you know? That's a, that's a very interesting point. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're right. Um, yeah. 
I'm shrugging, man. I know it's uh, that's that's weird, and uh, yeah, you know, again, manipulative. You know, I'm much more um, of the uh, of the the very European um, what they what they call in this in the business of ufology the psychosocial hypothesis, um, which m- means that something much more complicated about the nature of reality, society, and the mind is going on with with flying saucers, and. Um, so there is that in saucer state, but there is also the fact that some very physical, very definite things have been happening to our heroes and somebody's doing it. Whether that somebody is alien or human, um, as you'll see, you've seen from the start of the new series, is now very much in the air. Very cool. Yeah, I like it, man. No, there's good conspiracy stuff in there, both uh, of the uh, extraterrestrial kind and, of course, also uh, very grounded in... Uh, our, our 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 own American government and yeah like you, like you said no you 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 hit good timing and you unfortunately you saw it coming we were hoping cooler heads would prevail over on our side of the pod but what are you going to do well I got I, I got to say I thought Henry would win I like everybody but um, I was kind of thinking to myself we're going to have to play this this thread we put in in a different way if she does so. I can't say I'm relieved because, you know, yeah. <laughs> I prefer our reality to be stable, but, you know. I, you know, are you going to use I, – I, uh, it really didn't hit me, although I saw uh, – I was in a bookstore and I saw the phrase Deep State used uh, as a title of a book and certainly part of this uh, current conspiracy theory that's going out there that it's the bureaucracy that – you know the the faceless bureaucracy. They're the ones that are really pulling the levers and conspiring against President Trump. And it's just like, yeah, it's called oh. checks and balances, man. I mean, it's like we all we all have been aware of the bureaucracy and and calling it deep state state certainly sounds cool. But uh, yeah. you know, I mean, so will will the phrase deep state uh, make it in uh, saucer state? Um, not, not really, because those opponents of Arcadia, of course, is, are dealing with the whole state. Um, they're, they're not somebody who has to go looking for that kind of stuff. They think that she's in charge of an enormous, uh, d- an enormous machine designed, designed to crush them. You know, um, but um, we, we it, it has made certain things easier. I mean, going in, I was thinking, will anybody buy um, the idea that Arcadia has created a small um, a, a small cabinet within the cabinet that, that, that she tends to refer to. Oh, these days, yeah, they'll buy that. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. No, it's uh, yeah. Well, I'm, well, we're we're happy to pres- provide the entertainment for you <laughs> over here. Jeez, oh, I mean, goodness. as if you didn't have you guys didn't have enough on your hands with Brexit and everything. Oh. And we're sorry for whatever whatever <laughs> portion of our blame you want to put on uh, on you know the portion of uh, Americans that influence. That wonderful decision. Jeez. Well, I, I, t- I tell you what, I think um, I think it's entirely possible America, maybe that I can't think of another one that's done it. Uh, the first state to actually shrug off a fascist takeover. Um, and, you know, if you guys manage to do that, then you'll be a beacon to the world again. Um, well, actually, I mean, the French have just done it. Say, with an- yeah, France, man. They beat us to it. <laughs> Uh, I, mean, I mean to say, I mean to say, with the guy actually in charge, and failing to implement that, um, with the, the country failing to let him do it, I, that's much more difficult than than winning winning an election. And it, I just watch so much, many um, wonderful examples of American resistance right now. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, we we've got some of that going over here. You know, it's this election over here is going to be a much closer run thing than than people have been thinking it is. I'm sure. Um, so you know, there's there's hope. There is hope, and, and that's the lovely thing about Saucer State that it is full of hope. That um, it, it, it UFO mythology tends two ways. It's either um, the government are out to get us with their black helicopters, or it's uh, the cosmic space brothers have arrived to um, to save us to all. Save us, yeah, yeah. And and we we like we like a bit of both, but 
and we like neither as well, and we're going to find our own path. But it's a path that that I, I think turns towards satisfaction. That we're we're um, we're aiming to provide a satisfactory conclusion. Possibly not everyone will get to that happy ending, but we'll um, we'll see about that as we go along. But there. There is a finish line in, in sight, anyway. Very cool. And and you know, did I, I know again when we initially talked about the Vertigo series, and also when you were, um, you know, deciding to kind of pull the plug on it and get back to it at a different time. Um, is you know, has your story changed because of what's going on, or as you said, I mean, you were you were leaning towards this anyway. But has yeah. but but really have have current events influenced what you're doing now with Saucer State even more than you anticipated? Yeah, yeah I mean we've we've shoved it into shape to make it definitely lean into that. But what, one of the lovely things for me writing these two lots of six is that I've got such dense plot notes on each issue that it, it's it's that lovely thing of finishing a story that. Um, you know, um, if you if you if you've plotted in advance, the ending is actually easy um, because I can just I can and, and especially if it's about mysteries, I can just in issue five I've just revealed a bunch of stuff and it's like that's just like ticking things off in a list. These are lot these are things I no longer have to explain. Understood. You know, and um, so that's that's a really nice feeling. Killing not killing off some background characters um, sometime later in the first six. Um, that was that was pleasing. That kind of wrapped up their their, their um, arc, if you like, in a satisfactory way. It, it's like I'm I'm consciously writing the last season of a TV show, which is is very pleasing. That's cool. Absolutely. I, I wanted to ask you about uh, any uh, current television that you might be uh, involved oh. with. Um, involved with? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. To what degree in terms of, I, I, you know, you might have just done a script and moved on to another show, or if you're on a, on a current writing staff, I'm not sure. No, well, I'm not on a current writing staff. Um, I'm, I'm working on some stuff. And I'm talking to some people about some stuff, and I'm afraid that's as far as it can go. Okay, no. I mean, none of it, none of it has the words "doctor" or "who" in it. I think I can say that safely. And okay. Because there's, there's going to be a tiny portion of your audience who prick their ears up about that. Oh, okay. of course, absolutely. <laughs> well, and I wanted to ask too because I'm looking at your blog and uh, your at the Emperor of the Daleks collection. Oh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this um, Forbidden Planet signing this coming Friday, and as well as Source Estate, I'm signing my new novel, Chalk, and I'm signing um, Doctor Who magazine, um, come out with these regular collections of their ancient comic strips, and I wrote a long run for them in the uh, 90s, and um, it's just been collected last week, and that, that's out in time for the Forbidden Flat Planet signing as well, so we figured let's sign that too. That's excellent, man. Very, very cool. Tell me about Chalk. Oh, it's, um, well, it's the novel I've always wanted to write. I, I worked on it for about 20 years. It's uh, um, about um, bullying in the 1980s at, at a school. And um, it's very personal. It's a horror novel. Um, yeah, I, I, my, I wrote my autobiographical novel, and it's a fantasy horror. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> It's it's got lots of eighties pop music in it as well. Great. It's it's about the magical power of pop music, which um, uh, yeah, I, I had Kieran over to stay and um, gave him a copy and said, now um, <laughs> I, I, I've been looking at the dates and when I started work on this, I kind of got there first, and he was like, it's okay, man, you know, nobody, <laughs> you know, but. Um, uh, no, so it, I'm very, very proud of it. It's my best work, and um, you know, it's uh, it's it's a tough novel, but I think uh, it's a novel that takes you through something tough and then brings you out the other side. You know, it doesn't leave you in the middle of it. I hear you. It, um, so that's it's really nice. That's out with with that and um, getting Source Estate back on the road within a few weeks of each other. It's been a very satisfying year. Outstanding. Yeah. That's great. Uh, 
is yeah. Do you? I'm achieving a lot of my um a lot of my long term aims this year. It's great, great, fantastic, man. No, I I can appreciate that from a creative standpoint. How that must feel. Um, for chalk is is it obvious like. Uh, are, are songs absolutely called out, or is there a playlist? I mean, do you have an eighties playlist already out there and everything that people can sync up with while reading chalk? Well, yes. I mean, um, the the publishers uh, tour dot com actually have put up a um, a YouTube chalk playlist um, of all the um, songs mentioned in the text. That's great. So that's rather rather nice. Well, I'm gonna look forward to that. I love that now. I love that that's become almost prerequisite now for any sort of uh novel that you give it that extra depth by you know kind of creating a soundtrack for it and everything and i was talking about that with uh alex segura of archie comics and his mm-hmm. and his uh, detective novels and he's been doing the same thing so uh, oh yeah yeah i'm gonna have to post that then I'll, i will uh if uh, i will go to tour and find the playlist then i'll uh, if there's a widget or whatever i'll make sure that i put it on uh, our uh, our post here for this podcast and that Brilliant. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. And you're doing Vampirella? I am. Uh, uh, Matt Idelson, who's one of my favorite editors, um, uh, uh, was my editor on Action Comics at DC, mm-hmm. um, at Dynamite now, and asked me if I wanted to do it. And, um, yeah, I, I'm having a great time. Um, it's very SJW indeed. I've got a... Um, uh, Vampirella's ended up in a um, dystopian future of America. Um, where where things have um, gone horribly horribly wrong in um, a way familiar to to you guys at the moment, and um, yeah, the uh, the first five issues are are that, and then um, and they're kind of that's exactly what we were talking about earlier. It's it's that macabre laughter. It's that um, that um, mocking nasty. <laughs> And um, and then there's two issues of um, rather light-hearted knockabout gothic romance, which I've, I've, I've romance with a small R, um, which I've I, so sorry a big R actually that it's the genre. I mean, not that pe- not that people are falling in love in it. Okay, oh. you know I always uh, love hearing your podcasts, and I noticed that you uh, had a must must have been a panel at uh, Bristol Con. Uh, Bristol is it Bristol Con Fringe? Is that the whole title? Yeah, um, uh, the con called Bristol Con have a, a, a monthly fringe meeting ah. and uh, with authors. And yeah, they've recorded uh, they recorded me talking about chalk and reading from it, um, and that's on the latest edition of my blog. Um, and actually, one of one of my Litchford uh, novellas was also up for the Locus Award, which is nice. Um, we'll hear, hear about that in a couple of months' time. Um, Actually, rather wonderfully. Um, uh, no, 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 no. Can't say that. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you need me to edit anything, or we can move on? You've edited yourself. Um, I'll, be, I'll mention possible edits after after we, we've stopped. <laughs> All right, man. No problem. It's okay. Uh, so you know, I always enjoy hearing your uh, when you do podcasts and didn't you, didn't you guys, your, your, and forgive me, I forget the name of your podcast where well, you kind of go around the horn on what's happening in, in sci-fi in general. You guys, didn't you win a, an award at uh, one of the big cons uh, in the last couple of years? Way, way back. The, the first podcast I was on, um, uh, the SF Squeecast, we won, yes. we won, the, we won the Hugo for best fan cast for the first two years of its existence. That's fantastic. Uh, and then recused ourselves, but um, well, that's since nice. then, and I and I, you know, seriously, Eisner season is upon us, and uh, I was talking to somebody, and it's like, you know, after you win a, while, a few, after a while, you really should recuse yourself and be like, all right, let's let other people kind of win, you know. Well, I, I don't know. I think I think circumstances vary hugely for that, but especially because it was a new category, and we felt we were winning because we. We were a whole bunch of authors, all of whom brought audiences to it. Sure. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like we felt, you know, we felt that um, we had a bit of an advantage, so we ought to get out of the way. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I understand. Well, that's right, because the Hugo's are fan, are fan uh, yeah. uh, awarded. Yeah. Since since then, I, I did another podcast of my own, which I've I, I've stopped doing. Um, what was that called? You know, Talk to me. It, it, the, the Cornell Collective. 
um, where I uh, interviewed three disparate creators every every time and um, you know got them to talk to each other. But I I, I found myself stressing out every month over it because it was a little, a little like running a party every month. Sure. Because you, you're introducing people who don't know each other and getting them to talk to each other, and actually, I, I just I, I, I lost the energy to do that for fun. You know, I do understand. Um, did you did you do it live? Did you do it in front of an audience? No, no. It would have been more fun if we did. Um, every now and then at the uh, Gallifrey conventions in LA, I'll resurrect the title just to be able to record a fun panel. Cool. Um, um, so it's kind of it's an annual podcast now. That's okay. That's fine. Is, is, so are the feed of your previous episodes, is, is there a, a feed somewhere that people can, you know, see them yep. all and download them? Uh, yep. Um, if you Google the Cornell Collective, you'll find I it. I will. Um, That's awesome. Um, it's all still out there. That's excellent, uh, man. No, you're – hey, man, seriously, I, I'm not saying this because you're on right now. You're always a delightful guest, and I've heard you moderate uh, some of those SFWE uh, podcasts and that and, and – be an you know enthusiastic uh, participant and everything. So it's no, it's always a pleasure hearing your uh, your point of view. And I think the people that you put together a lot of times, at least again uh, the SFWE podcast, they are always a bunch of interesting people uh, ha- having an interesting group conversation. Well, yeah, I mean it's um, I'm, presenting is something I really love doing, and I don't get to do it very much. So it's it's quite nice to to one of these days I'll get back to doing a podcast. You know, it's uh, great it's something. Yeah, because as you must know, you know this is satisfying in and of itself. No isn't question, it? absolutely, mean, man. God, yes. I mean, you, haven't you know, and I, you know, I've got you know, I've I've got twenty five years in in radio and uh, twelve years in podcasting, and no, I get to do things with the podcast that I just never got the opportunity to do in radio, and I and I'm pleased that I still have the career in radio and everything, but uh, it's fun to do this, and it's opened other doors for me as well that. Radio and on itself never did. How, how many editions is this for you? How many episodes? Yeah. Oh God. Uh, you know, I, I I sometimes lose count. If I'm not at 800, I'm close. Wow. And you know, well, it's fun. It's my talk show. And and as you said, in terms of gathering people for the virtual party that the podcast would be, that's kind of why I like doing the one on ones because it's easier, and also why I never wanted a, a co host. Because it's just, you know, it's just you and me and we're, you know, expressing our thoughts and I get, to, you know, I think the, the listener gets to uh, hear more of the guest and understand where they're coming from and a deeper appreciation of what inspires them. And yeah, it's absolutely gratifying. Well, you, you certainly ask good questions. I mean, you kind of do lead lead a guest in and let them talk in a good way. It's a, it's a, mind you, after 800 editions, I, I guess you're really good at this. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I, yeah, either that or I'm still fooling myself. But I, you know, I mean, I, well, and again, as opposed to trying to do it on a radio or, or a television platform or something, I don't have a, a network or a, a content provider saying, yeah, that's enough. You know, I mean, and I do. I enjoy it. I, I like that it's mine. And I get to do whatever I want. And if I like when I had Tony Hendron, I mean, it certainly has nothing to do with comic books, but uh, mm-hmm. it was a great opportunity to talk to a guy who I had always admired his work. And I am I'm, I, I, I love, you know, as as I'm sure a lot of creatives do, you know, I, I love pop culture and I'm interested in what is again, what inspired some of the ideas. And, and that's why, you know, God, getting a chance to talk to him was really fantastic. And, and uh, yeah. you know, I I I really look forward to showing this American audience too that hey you might only know him from being spinal taps manager with the cricket bat but I'm like this guy is responsible for so much great humor for yeah. you know for 40 plus years god 50 plus years I know he could, and it was great even learning that he was in Cambridge at the same time as the pythons and you know and also just that whole explosion of british comedy fascinates the hell out of me that started with beyond the fringe and, you yeah. know, everything that came from that. So, yeah, it was, you know, and, it, you know, it was great. I uh, Last uh, uh, October at uh, New York Con, I ran into Dave Gibbons. And Dave's always, yeah. you know, as uh, you know better than I, such a great guy. And he was like, Very, he was so excited. He's like, you talked to Tony Hendra. He's like, oh, my God. He goes, you know, I was really good friends with his younger brother. <laughs> and he just told me these Tony <laughs> Hendra stories. I'm like, that's fantastic. So That's lovely. Yeah. There's 
Dave wears his celebrity so lightly. Yes. Um, he's, he's one of those guys that I think every now and then would, would probably have to, you know, kind of, um, you know, remind himself that, that he's, he's also a big celebrity. Yes. <laughs> that kind of, you know, I, I, I probably shouldn't just stand here in this corridor. <laughs> I hear you, man. Hey, now we mentioned Doctor Who, so what do you think of the new season? Oh, it's brilliant. It's very, very good. Um, it, it, it's just delightful. I love the um, the very gentle arc this year, the, um, the very simple one-and-done stories. Bill is amazing. Yeah. Um, and the way that they've actually grown this Doctor and given him a character arc has been lovely to behold. You know, it's... Um, We've gone from very, very um, stiff, very, very morally ambiguous through a kind of a midlife crisis to very relaxed with himself. And uh, it, it's it, it's not often that a, an actor playing the Doctor will actually be able to do proper proper progression. You know, I do know. I hear what you're saying, and I agree with you. And I wasn't. I, I've always been a Peter Capaldi fan, going back to Local Hero. That's the first thing I think mm. I saw him in when he was a kid. Well, we were all kids, I guess. Uh, mm. But uh, and was really excited when I heard he was going to be the Doctor. But I wasn't crazy about that first season, and I'm not sure why. But I did, oh. I did grow to love him, and and I do. And now I am sorry to see him go because he is, as you say, uh, I've enjoyed the character progression, and he is comfortable in his Doctor skin, and and I'm, mm. you know the character at least is and everything, and it's fun to watch him run around uh, now with all of that. Uh, character arc behind him and part of him, so pretty neat. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah. So uh, I, I still, I, I, I found myself having lunch with Matthew Graham the other day, and um, he pointed out that I just said we with regards to Doctor Who. Um, <laughs> that I, I kind of feel like I'm still, um, uh, I'm, I'm still. Uh, Cheering them on from the uh, from from the stands, you know. Well, it's, uh, but you are part of the family, man. I mean, you know, at least I, you know, Big Finish really carried the torch when the lights were off, and you know, it was only Big Finish that was still thinking about doing new stories and stuff. And you know, Bernie Summerfield and all and all of your contributions, and again in the comics and in the novels, and certainly on the series as well. I mean, so. You know, it's like um, a, a guy, and I'm, right now I'm blanking on any, David Gerald from Star Trek, doing Trouble mm. with Tribbles and always being, you know, I mean, I think once a Who writer or once a Trek writer, always a Trek writer or Who writer. Maybe maybe so. I've, I've you know, I've done my best as to try and get known for other things. And oh, sure. I, still get a, I still get a little neurotic about um, always referring back to who, but I've allowed myself to enjoy it again in recent years. I mean, enjoy the business of being part of it all. And, um, I, I think I'd be denying myself a lot of pleasure if I was to, um, you know, try and, um, try and push away from it too much. But, um, anyway, so it's, it's, it's a delight that it's still going strong, you know, and, um, I've actually got, um, uh, fonder and fonder of it the further I go from it, which is great. I understand. I could appreciate that. And certainly you do want to, you know, stand on your own and be known for your your own ideas. And, and that's why it's great that you're doing Chalk and uh, your, and now I'm blanking, but we had talked about it a few years ago, uh, your your uh, your novel series of, uh, wasn't it Police and the, Time Travel? Yeah, The Shadow Police. Yes. And, uh, and uh, also the Litchford books, but now as as we speak, um, literally beside the laptop on which um, I'm uh, I'm skyping you, um, is what I'm re- my my <laughs> my reading matter at the moment is uh, um, a semi academic discourse on the evil of the Daleks by Simon Gary. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is how distant I am from Doctor Who. <laughs> That's all right, man. You know, hey, you grew up, Capaldi grew up a fan. I mean, we, you know, we, we grew up as fans of this stuff. And then the added level of working with it, I guess, and, I, and I'm and i sure at one point, because I always say this sometimes about uh, even broadcasting in general, where it's like, hey, it may, on the outside, it may seem glamorous, but really it's like working at a hardware store. And then on your downtime, 
you know, going home and diving into a, a bucket of screws or nails or something like that. And it's like, don't you want to do something else? My God. But again, I mean, I'm still fascinated by the changes in American broadcasting that are currently happening and the history of broadcasting always is exciting. I even enjoyed uh, The Hour, the BBC uh, show. Right. Oh, I love right. that. I thought that was great. And and really, yeah. I, and really any sort... And also even the... Uh, Doctor Who movie that they made uh, about William Hartnell yeah. and the creation yeah. of Doctor Who and stuff. Any any golden age of broadcasting stuff. God, even the beginning of the King's Speech, when you see all those yeah. gigantic mammoth transmitters as the you know uh, uh, his uh, the 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 original King's father is getting ready to you know make an address and stuff. Any broadcast stuff like that, I'm a, I'm a total geek for. So oh, it's it's lovely stuff. It's um. Uh, you know, one of the one of the lovely things, the, the study of Doctor Who can lead you in a, a lot of di- different directions. I mean, Doctor Who fandom is has been the the place of creation for so many creatives in so many different areas, but but particularly writers. You know, it's the way that show pushes its writers forward and shines a spotlight on them and actually wants to tell the world who they are is like no other. You know, that's cool. No, that's great. And, Go on, please. Yeah. And, and that's still the case. And I, I think that kind of um, that encourages writers to, to begin, you know, uh, and uh, I think we're all looking to, to keep in place that ladder of, of you know, making sure the show grows, grows creatives, which it's always done a great job of doing it and Star Trek both, you know. Definitely. I You know, I mm. wonder um, how much the new platforms like, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, and things. Um, has it afforded you the opportunity to expand and 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 uh, try and uh, you know get some things developed? And how how have things been for you in this new era of multiple platforms and opportunities from from a television and even film standpoint? Um, pleasing. <laughs> 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 That's one of the things I guess you can't talk about right now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> that's good. Well, that's good news, Paul. I was certainly hoping that would be the you know along the lines of the answer. So that's that's terrific because you know I wonder about oversaturation and because God, so many good things are being made that yeah. And how do you have the budget to to have all these additional platforms and things? And God, they keep growing. And it and it mm. does. I mean, I, I've seen television executives on on you know here in America kind of say, "When's it going to end?" I mean, it's great because of the quality yeah. that's being made, but it's, it's also a question of who's getting the chance to watch it. Mm. I, I think um, a new balance will have to come along, which will possibly involve the networks evolving into something else. Yes. You know, it's uh, you know. Uh, Network TV isn't going anywhere, but I, I think that more and more um, network is about um, live spectacle. Um, you know, the the shows which only really exist while they're happening, um, and you want to be there watching and commentating on Twitter, you know, um, are very much things that are there for broadcast. Whereas... Your, your quality drama can wait for you to download the whole set, you know. And um, so, you know, I, I think it'll it'll just come to a, a, a new balance as, as time goes on. Um, yeah, I hear you. No, I agree. No, we mentioned Supergirl. What are you, what are your thoughts on uh, the current television uh, superhero fair? Oh, I, I, I love Supergirl. Um, I, I still really like Agents of Shield. Um, I think it's perked up again this year. I agree with you. Um, uh, I, I, if I had time, I'm sure I'd like another number of the other DC shows, but <laughs> we, we, we content ourselves with Supergirl. Um, I'm, um, what else is out there? Uh, so not watching the flash. Um, we're not, but we really should be because everybody seems to love I it. I gotta tell you, it's my favorite of the, uh, of the four. And I mean, I, and I right. do think they're, they all have their own merits, but yeah, I, I just, I, I, they really get the, fl- and they get Supergirl right too. And it's been yeah. what a what a nice surprise when the comic book has had its troubles uh, finding a yeah. coherent kind of run and stuff like that. That 
uh, this television version is as focused and, and great as it is. I, I think you, you put an, uh, a superhero who just wants to save people and for whom taking on bad guys is an unfortunate side effect of saving people, um, who's actually re- a really nice person uh, on screen, and it always works. I'm, I'm not sure why anybody would want to darken those characters up. <laughs> Um, when um, when mainstream audiences especially really love a bit of Christopher Reeve, you know? Oh, totally. And that was funny, too, that beginning of this season when they had the first two episodes and Superman was there. And I loved reading the blogs. Oh, no. That's going to take the focus away from Supergirl. It's going to only make people want more Superman and less Supergirl. And it's like, no, it's it's the same as in comics when, you know, they're like, oh, Green Arrow couldn't beat, you know, Batman. And it's like, well, who's who's the name of the cup? Co- you know, whose name is on the cover? That's that's the hero. <laughs> and I think it made her stronger by the fact that Superman can come along into her show, and she is lessened, lessened by not a jot. Yes. Uh, and um, no, it's it's a very well written show. Um, I uh, yeah, so I've been enjoying that a lot. Um, what, what else are we, we liking? American Gods, which um, we are going to get to seeing tonight, hopefully. Um, oh, does it debut <laughs> tonight? In, uh, or is it? No, or no. is that just the regular time it airs uh, in England? Just the regular time. It's the, the night after it does over there. Got it. Um, uh, I, and yeah, it's great. That's, that's been a delight. Oh, my God, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I was bummed that Brian Fuller walked away from Star Trek Discovery but I, when I heard it was American Gods, I'm like, well, I can't blame him. And also, uh, it's it's tremendous. It's it's very it's it's excellent. And we we really liked um, Westworld. Um, I, I'm, um, I'm I'm saying we myself and my wife. Okay. You know, we, we, this, this sounds like the royal we of television. You know, but um, <laughs> it's um, uh, yeah. There's lots of good stuff on at the moment. Um, we 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 were huge fans of Person of Interest, which. Believe it or not, in Britain, finally came to a um, came to a conclusion um, three nights ago. Wow! Uh, uh, yeah, they really took a long time to get it over here, and, and I have this puritanical attitude towards um, illegal downloading. I I won't do it. I respect that. Um, I I don't want anybody else to do it, so I can't do it. And um, so we waited for a very long time for our person of interest season uh, series finale. Um, and uh, that was brilliant. I understand. I, so, I We had previous conversations about this, and I told you my own frustration when American television pulled the plug on uh, on Spooks, MI5, here in I, in America. I, I love that show. And, you know, yeah. went out and bought the, uh, the, the subsequent DVDs. And, uh, and it came to a good conclusion. I love the movie. Oh, right. I, I haven't seen the movie. I, I, no, I'm way behind with that. But... Um, yeah, so, yeah, some nice things out there right now. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. Very cool. Well, that's why I always I appreciate your point of view on it as as a, as a screenwriter and everything, and I, I want to know what your thoughts are on what's happening in, in TV and film. And, uh, you know, really, Saucer State, uh, great start. Again, you afforded me the opportunity to read the first two issues, and the first issue comes out uh, Wednesday the 24th uh, from IDW. And, uh, again, it will be on the stands when I release this because the likelihood is uh, I'll probably be releasing this either during the day or in the evening on Wednesday. Uh, right. So, uh, but, yeah, th- dude, thanks for coming back. Always. Uh, truly a pleasure. And uh, I, uh, I am happy to help you uh, promote whatever, whatever you need promoting. So c- continued success with Vampirella and Saucer State and also these secret projects that when, when they become uh, public information, I hope you'll come back and we can talk about them. Well, I would love to. Thank you so much for having me back, Joe. There we go, Paul Cornell. It's a pleasure uh, having him back. And as I said, I, I hope we don't wait as long for the next uh, conversation because it's always a pleasure. Good podcaster too, man, and a hell of a panel moderator. Uh, I, I would really, if if I had the wherewithal and were to start my own uh, broadcast network, I would absolutely hire Paul Cornell if he had the time to uh, host and moderate because I think he is uh, one of those really fine. Uh, guys that can can really wrangle uh, a multi guest panel and get a very interesting discussion going. So uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to go back and uh, listen to a bunch of his uh, older podcasts, and certainly that uh, more recent uh, uh, podcast that he did 
uh, from uh, one of his conventions, I believe a Doctor Who convention. Hope you really enjoyed today's episode of Word Balloon. It was a pleasure bringing it to you today, sponsored by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, for your support. And uh, InStockTrades.com, where, again, there are tremendous books waiting for you at InStockTrades. Um, you can get things like, uh, let's see, how about uh, Batman and Robin, uh, Dark Knight versus White Knight. Uh, this collects uh, Batman and Robin 17 through 25, and it's uh, 42% off. It's just $13.33. You can get Dark X-Men. And I remember when uh, Paul was doing this. I'm working with Leonard Kirk. That's a terrible Paul imitation. I apologize, Paul. But I know he loves uh, working with uh, Leonard, and uh, they were a great team. I believe they also worked on Captain Britain back in the day. But uh, Dark X-Men trade paperback, uh, 45% off. It is $9.34. There is, uh, you can go back and get uh, the first volume of, actually the first two volumes of uh, Saucer Country, uh, thankfully. And uh, again, this is uh, Paul Cornell and Ryan Kelly. And uh, volume one is run. It's 42% off and it's $8.69. And Eclix issues one through six. And then seven through 14 uh, it's the reluctant uh, candidate, and uh, that is uh, volume two, forty-two percent off, and it's nine dollars and eighty-five cents. So uh, definitely catch up on uh, Saucer State with uh, the original issues of Saucer Country. Just a few of the great books that are available from uh, Paul Cornell through InStockTrades.com. I also see uh, some of his Wolverine work. Uh, I see uh, Three Months to Die, uh, that fine book uh, from a few years back. Paul Cornell and Ryan Stegman. And then um, that's uh, 45% off. It's $13.74. You can also get book two of uh, Three Months to Die. And that uh, is 45% off, $10.99. And then there's uh, volume two, Killable, of Wolverine. And uh, that's uh, Paul and Alan Davis and uh, Micro Pier Federici. I certainly hope I'm saying your name right there, uh, Mirko. But uh, that's 45% off and $10.99. Great books from Paul Cornell available at InStockTrades.com. You will find great deals at great prices. InStockTrades.com. Thanks again for listening to today's Word Balloon. Looking forward to talking to you on the next episode. May is not done. That means I'm not done. At the very least, we got Nick Spencer still to come uh, talking about Secret Empire now that we are uh, three issues in, zero, one, and two, and the free comic book day issue. So three and a half issues in. But uh, he's got thoughts, and I do too, and it's a pleasure to welcome Nick back to talk about this controversial Captain America story. How dare you, Marvel? (sighs) All right, I need to lie down. Uh, Until next time, uh, if you have any questions or comments about the show, reach me via email, john at wordballoon.com. Follow me on Twitter and yell at me there, uh, at John Word Balloon, or on Facebook under my name, John Suntress, and the Word Balloon Network. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2017.